Okay, uh, is this on? Can you guys hear me? Okay, I'll pull it around a bit. Okay, so just a bit about me. Um, like you said, my name's Jeremy Quinton. Um, I'm a PHP developer. I've been doing PHP for about 10 years. Um, originally from Cape Town, South Africa, but I've been living in London, working in London for the past six years. Um, I currently work at Comic Relief on the um, scalable fundraising platform. So just a bit of a shameless plug. I thought I'd mention this because it's quite an interesting use case for PHP. Uh, Comic Relief um, have got a massive implementation of PHP. A lot of it bespoke, but they use a lot of Drupal too. Um, and in 2011, they raised 108 million pounds for charity. Um, so PHP, um, you know, indirectly is actually saving lives because most of that money goes to some of the poorest communities in Africa. Um, so it's quite a different use case. Uh, Red Nose Day is back on the 15th of March 2013, um, so take a look out for it. The night of TV is on BBC One, it's really good. Okay, so the future of the PHP development environment. I've broken this talk up into three distinct parts. Uh, parts. So I'll basically talk about the past a bit. Um, so sort of the problems we've had with the PHP development environment. I talk about the present, so a present solution to solve some of these uh, problems. And then I talk uh, about the future and where that's going. Um, just a warning though, this talk contains Ruby. Um, I did a precursor to this talk at PHP London in December, and I got a bit of a uh, stick because I was t talking at a PHP meetup, and you know, two of the tools I talked today uh, about are Ruby. Um, to be honest, I've never done Ruby commercially or anything like that. Um, I can't code in Ruby. The only thing I can do is variable assignments and cut and paste, which is uh, what I've done. Um, but I think we've got to keep an open mind. You know, we need to adopt. Um, you know, tools and techniques of other languages, especially if they're going to make our lives easier. So let's talk a bit about the past. Um, so that literally there is my first development environment, um, really cool monitor. Um, but I, that's where I started out with PHP. And uh, in those days, you know, the parad paradigm was install everything locally. Um, and it still is for a lot of developers. But generally, uh, you know, as an intern, you're given a couple of tasks. And one of my first tasks as an intern was, you know, to set up my development environment. And I remember it took me literally a couple of days, you know, you know learning how to use a package manager, setting up a virtual host, uh, all those kind of things. And, um, you know, that's, that's where you start. You know, you know the joke, there's no place like local host. Um, but, but how does a newbie install PHP? I mean, those are the instructions of php.net. I literally just cut and paste this. But you can see this sort of theme here. You've got you know, Unix-based system, Windows, and a bit there on Mac. Um, but you know, there's quite a bit of stuff there, especially if you're new to PHP. Um, and I think developers kind of got like, sick of this. We, we kind of got sick of this idea of having to install everything locally. Um, so we came up with some solutions. Um, I've just got a couple here. You guys might use something else. But you know, easy PHP ZAMP. ZAMP's quite cool. You get an extra feature. You get pull chucked in for some reason. Um, you know, then you might use a package manager on Mac, like Homebrew or Mac ports. Um, you know, something on Linux like apt or yam. Um, that's MAMP. The gray one's MAMPRO. You actually can pay for a tool to set up your development environment, which is quite interesting. But we really try to you know, sort of make our lives a bit easier. But the paradigm is still install everything locally. You know? But the reality is the, ecos the ecosystem around the LAMP stack has changed quite a bit. So it's no longer just you know, LAMP. We're using so many other technologies. I mean, that's not an exhaustive list, but you know, we're using messaging. We're using uh, you know, a NoSQL solution. Um, we're using something else in our PHP applications. So all of a sudden, you know, installing everything locally and then installing a message queue locally on your computer, how does that work? And you know, you've got a dev on Mac and a, and a dev on, on Windows. How does the, the Windows developer, you know, does that messaging queue even work on Windows? Um, so the ecosystem's changed. So the modern developed environment has become more complex for a lot of us. Um, but then there's also the concept of the snowflake. Um, it's a really good blog post by Martin Fowler. A lot of you will know who Martin Fowler is from his books. But I definitely recommend you go and um, you know, read it. But the, the concept of the production snowflakes in many ways can be applied to our development environments. The general co concept is of uniqueness. The fact that um, uh, you know, a lot of our development environments are unique. So for example, if you took everyone in this room, if you took each of our, our, our development environments, you'd probably find they're pretty unique in structure, just like snowflakes are unique. Um, 
But one developer you know, wants to get a change from his development environment to another developer's machine, that's not straightforward and easy to do. And also the, the idea that, that our development environments aren't reproducible. So you know, you've been developing and hacking away on PHP for two years locally, you've made so many hacks and configurations and so on, your hard drive crashes, you know, it takes you two days to get back up and running to where you were and you can't even remember how you did things, you start Googling and, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, then, let's play a little game, okay? So spot the difference. Can anyone spot the difference in these pictures? There's about seven. Anyone? Yeah. So there we go. So there's a, there's a, there's a couple of you know, differences. The spot the difference is, is really, um, it's really simpler, uh, um, similar to the dev prod parity concept, right? And the dev prod parity uh, concept is keep development, staging, and production as similar as possible, right? A lot of the times that's not true. Our, de our development environments are completely different to staging and production. 12factor.net, um, I, I really recommend that site. Um, there's 12 points on there about you know, deploying and doing stuff with your applications. Uh, it was put up by, the, I think, some of the guys who did the Euroka platform. But dev prod uh, par uh, parity is one of the concepts there. And dev prod parity, uh, parity is broken up into three things. Um, you know, it's time. So you know, you write code today, but it only maybe goes live in a week. Um, it's got a people element to it. So basically, the guys that are writing the code aren't always the guys deploying the code. And then there's the tools gap. You know, so basically, our development environment is comp you know different. You know, to a staging and production. Um, so it's a really important concept. And the tools I'm going to talk about later, you know, solve this problem. So let's go to a, a quick summary of these past and present problems, right? So setting up the modern development environment where you've got all these moving parts isn't straightforward. Um, I see there's a bit of a mistake there with the comma, sorry about that. Um, this idea of uniqueness, so like a snowflake, our development environments are unique in structure. Um, switching be between projects with different dependencies is difficult. So let's say you're working on two different APIs. You know, one API is dependent on some backend service, maybe MongoDB. You've got another API, uh, API that's maybe got a messaging queue behind it. You know, you set all that stuff up locally. Switching between those two projects and developing on, on both of them, you know, the dependencies and stuff start to maybe, you know, conflict. Um, and then, you know, dev prod parity, that our local development environments differ significantly from production and staging and so on. So how do we solve these problems? Um, you know, these are some of the problems I've encountered. Maybe you've encountered some of them, and I'm sure there's, there's other problems you guys have encountered. But how do we solve them? Vagrant, right? I don't know, how many people in this room are using Vagrant at the moment? Okay, that's really cool. Um, for those that aren't using it, um, I'd argue it is the future. Um, because it's drastically changed the way we um, configure and set up our development environments. Um, the idea is pretty simple. It's, this is a high level concept on this slide, but once you've configured Vagrant, it's Vagrant up. Um, there's, um, you know, that's on the command line, so you drop into a terminal or whatever, but Vagrant up and it brings up your development environment. So that's really cool. So we take everyone in this room, we distribute the, we give everyone a copy of the development environment, everyone's vagrant up and everyone's got the same development environment. Um, it's really, really useful. So just a bit more about the vagrant idea and the concept. So I took a, a um, definition of you know, vagrantup.com, but it's a tool to transparently manage all the complex, p complex parts of modern development with, with, within a virtual environment without affecting the everyday workflow of the developer too much. So I kind of like to think of vagrant as the magic, but the idea is you, that you've got a provider, which is a virtualization. So over here, I've got VirtualBox. I don't know if any of you have used uh, VirtualBox. It's a really, really cool tool. Um, you know, it's completely free. It's a, it's a virtualization tool. Um, it's open source, and it's backed by Oracle. There's, there's, there's you know, frequent updates of it all the time, which is really good. Um, but you've, you've got Vagrant, and you've got a, a provider for your virtualization. So your development environment is virtualized, and then you've got a provisioner. So Chef is the example uh, I've used here. You can also use Puppet. Um, my examples later have Chef Solo in them, and I'll talk a bit more about Chef later, but you can also use Bash Scripts. So you've got a virtual environment, it's managed with a, a configuration file which is Vagrant, and you bring up the virtual environment and you install the version of PHP that you want, um, install the version of MySQL you want, you know, the 
the modules you want for PHP. I didn't mention it earlier, but I think there's something like 150 um, extensions for PHP, whether they bundled external or Peckle. So you can imagine when you've got that unique st structure in your development environments, um, you know, how, what, like, everyone's got, you know, different versions of extensions and, and modules installed, you know. So um, the idea with the provisioner is that you've actually, um, an another way to kind of describe it is, you know, everyone's using a Composer now to manage their dependencies in their projects. So it's kind of managing the dependencies for your infrastructure. That's a another way to think about it. So a basic wor a Vagrant workflow. So the idea, like I've already mentioned, um, you start work in the morning, you run Vagrant up, brings up your development environment, you start writing some code, hack away and so on. Um, if you want access to the virtual machine, um, uh, you can use Vagrant SSH, which is obviously really useful. So Vagrant SSH, and then you're into the virtual machine. Um, when you're done for the day, you run Vagrant Halt, and that'll shut down the machine. Um, there's quite a few commands on the next slide, which I'll come to, but then you've got Vagrant Destroy. So let's say you bring up the virtual machine, you hack around with it, you completely mess up the configurations or something. You can basically destroy that virtual machine by running uh, Vagrant Destroy. Um, and then the last bit is Vagrant provision. So basically, if a developer makes a change to the development environment and they commit that to uh, your, your uh, you know, Git or whatever, you bring that change back down. If you run Vagrant provision, it'll install that new extension for PHP or you know, that new version of MySQL and so on. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. So Vagrant is a command line tool. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's written in Ruby. Um, and it's supported on most major operating systems, so it works on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Um, I've only really used it on Mac. I've heard some complaints, you know, of some issues down there, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. But um, generally, it's cross-platform, which is really good. That's a list of the commands, so if you run Vagrant help, you'll sort of get that output. Really useful if you're starting out with Vagrant, because you can run the help command against them and, you know, get some more info on them. So let's go a bit into how Vagrant works. Um, so a Vagrant instance is managed with a Vagrant file, um, which is Ruby syntax, like I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, some people might get you know scared of the idea of the Ruby syntax, but it's basically just you know general variable assignments that you're doing. Um, you've got 28 configuration options. I'm going to demo roughly about I think seven today. You don't need to know all of them, um, and the demo I'm doing is quite basic because um, it's all I've sort of got time for. But uh, you know, I will. I'll talk more about you know, advanced Vagrant setups a bit later. So ideally, to use VirtualBox and use the virtualization layer with Vagrant, you need a box file. So you can uh, basically add the box file on the command line, which I'll show that command soon, but it's like Vagrant box add the box file name, which is that top line over there, so Vagrant Center 6.3, and then where the box file is. So if you've got the box file, you can give it to another developer. But if you don't have the box file, you can use a URL. Um, and so, basically, if you run Vagrant up, Vagrant will go and fetch the box file and pull it down and then unpackage it. So you've got, um, you know, you've got the box file. So, I mean, the idea is that every Vagrant virtual environment requires a box file to build off, okay? So you need to get a box file. Um, so there's three methods to get a box file, okay? The first one is to down a, uh, download a box file from uh, vagrant.es. Uh, um, I had a look there when I was preparing this talk. There was about 60 different box files, um, FreeBSD, um, different versions of Linux, and so on. The only thing that scares me a bit about downloading these box files is it is a, a virtual environment, so you know I haven't actually used one of them. But someone could, you know, potentially install something that's you know malicious on there. Um, you know, you know, if you're security conscious, there's something to think about. But if you're just going to play around with it locally and you're not going to put code on there that's got like, you know, um, stuff that's too secure, you should be okay. It's it's a good way to get started. Um, the other way to create a box file is to uh, using the instructions of vagrantup.com. Um, I've done this before. I think the documentation's on it's got a bit better, but ideally the way to do it is uh, you have VirtualBox. Um, you'll put your, your ISO in, you'll install the operating system, you'll then uh, you know, run a couple of, uh, what you'll do is you set up some users on the box, you, you, you do a couple of configuration things, and then you package it as a box file. And it's a bit tedious and a bit time consuming to do. So um, if you really want to understand how a box file works, you know, the instructions on Vagrant Up, you can go and read them. But the third one is the step I definitely recommend. Um, so Viwi, um, it's a really, really cool open source project. Um, I don't know if Andy 
uh, Andy's one of the developers I work with. I don't know if he's in this room. He might, might be next door. But he actually showed me the project, so I've got to give him some credit for that. But it's a really cool way to build box files. Um, it's all on the command line, but the idea is pretty simple. You've got a template per sort of operating system. So if it's... Um, you know, and this is just my basic understanding of it, but you know, if you, you've got a template file, so if you want to build CentOS or Red Hat or Ubuntu and so on, you basically just use one of the predefined templates that come in the um, project, and then you run a couple of VW commands. They're all documented you know, on the project, but basically you can build a box file really quickly. And it's only a process you kind of have to do once. So once you've got a, a box file, like I use CentOS 6.3 for development because I find it boots really quickly, which is really nice. Um, but once you've built a box file, you've got that, that box file. You don't have to do it over and over. But if you want to you know, build an Ubuntu box file or something else, or you know, a new version of um, you know, Linux comes out and so on, you want to build that, then you can use VW. It's a really cool tool. Um, I could probably do a whole talk on it, so I can't go into too much detail on it. Okay, so setting up your first instance. So we've got a, we've got a box file. Um, so basically, we've got to add that box file. Um, so you can uh, add a, a box file also from a URL, but you add the box file to Vagrant, and then you run Vagrant init. So what Vagrant init does is it creates you a Vagrant file, and then at the top of that Vagrant file, so if I go back, oh, sorry, I meant to go, if, so, you then have to edit that Vagrant file that it generates and put the, the name. So in this case, base would be at the top of the file, sorry. Um, base would be at the top of the, the file. And then Vagrant up, and that would literally boot the virtual machine locally on your computer. So, so that's basically your first instance. But that's not really useful, because what you're going to have is you'll have a version of Linux. It's not going to have PHP or MySQL on it, uh, you know, or anything like that. OK, so let's talk a bit more about the Vagrant configuration file. So I've been through the sort of the two uh, top options. Um, so the option over there, config uh, booting GUI mode. So booting in GUI mode is quite useful because if you bring up a virtual machine, the default with Vagrant is headless. So you won't even see the machine booting, but you'll have this virtual machine running on your machine. But it's quite useful for if you, you, know, you provision a machine and maybe you know, there's something wrong. Say like Apache doesn't start up when the machine boots, you'll be able to see that. But generally, you can switch that off, but it is good for debugging. Um, then the other concept, Vagrant has two kind of uh, concepts of net, net, uh, networking. I won't talk too much about port forwarding. That's the default that comes out the box. The other thing you can use is uh, host-only networking. It's also more secure by default. But the idea is, is that this virtual machine is now going to have an IP address. So as developers, you know, we used to host names to IP addresses. So you know, in your local host file you know, on, your, on your machine, you can start mapping host names you know, to IP addresses. Um, <laughs> So going a bit back to the paradigm of installing everything locally, the really cool thing with installing everything locally is you just drop a PHP file into your document root, you refresh the browser, and you can see your code. Um, Vagrant kind of keeps that idea by using a, a share folder, right? So what you do is you share a folder on your machine, um, and that folder is available on, on the virtual machine. So you've got an identifier, um, which is the first sort of argument to this um, share folder configuration option. So Vagrant Demo will actually be, there'd be a folder called Vagrant Demo that would have your, say, your projects folder. So over here, I've just shared the current folder I'm in. So with how Vagrant works is with a Vagrant file, when you run Vagrant up, um, you're in the directory that the Vagrant file is. So I'm just sharing the directory I'm in, but you could, you know, there share your, um, your projects folder or whatever. I switched NFS on, so that won't work for Windows users, um, but it's pretty uh, useful to do because Vagrant comes with a default file sharing mechanism that's actually really, really slow. Um, we found this out the hard way. We had a, a test of, uh, a, a suite of unit tests that was running. And as the tests got like more and more, they became slower and slower. So a bit of research, it was pretty simple on the Vagrant website. It recommends that you use NFS. Um, we've got to run this on Windows. So if you've got a Windows developer in your team, what you can do is you can create a Samba share and then automatically mount that share um, from uh, the virtual machine. Um, but if you can use NFS, use it because it's a lot quicker and you don't have any sort of like, you know, delays or slowness. Um, Okay, and then the cool stuff. So Chef Solo, I'll give you some examples of Chef Solo. And so Chef's another thing I could probably do a 45-minute talk on. But I'll just take you some, through some basics of it just to give you the, the concepts and the ideas. Um, but ideally, yeah, I'm, I'm configuring my provisioner. So basically, I'm giving the path to my cookbooks, um, uh, my roles, the path to my roles, and then I'm adding role, which is local. So 
just a bit more on Chef, right? So Chef is a provisioning tool. It was originally built for the, the cloud. And this stuff would have been really useful to me 10 years ago. I, I worked at a hosting company where we set up uh, a, a shared servers, you know, like a shared server, and you'd have like 50 different websites on it. And every time we commissioned a new sort of production server, we had like, you know, bash scripts, you know, pull mixed with PHP to kind of, you know, build this, you know, um, machine to host websites. Um, it was really painful. But Chef is a, a provisioning tool. So yes, it was a, originally built for the cloud, but if you're running, say, a, de a dedicated server um, you know, in a data center, you can still provision your machine with Chef Solo. Chef Solo is the free open source version. The other configuration of Chef is uh, Chef Server, which I've never used. Um, but that's a more paid for, but it's really cool. If you've got the money to you know, uh, pay for it, it's really cool and something worth looking at. But I'm generally talking now about Chef Solo. Um, it's also written in Ruby. It's a Ruby domain-specific language. Um, so my experience with Chef, uh, I've written a couple of um, recipes, so let me just explain that. So the idea is it uses cooking terms, first of all. So when you're trying to Google stuff, you get like cooking books on Amazon, um, which is not really useful. Um, but uh, you've got this idea of a cookbook. So you'd have a cookbook for um, Apache, for example. And then you'd have a recipe that would install a default install of Apache and then give, uh, you know, Apache would say the default configuration and you could obviously change that default con uh, configuration. Then you'd have another recipe, you know, so you'd have a recipe that would install a specific, you know, module of Apache. Then you'd have a cookbook for PHP. So your cookbook for PHP would just install, you know, maybe the base version of, of PHP, say, you know, 5.0 you know, 3.22 with, you know, a specific set of, you know, modules. Um, you know, there's the, the, really, the really cool thing I like about Chef is it's um, backed by ops code, but all the, um, you know, cookbooks and recipes, there's loads of free ones out there that are like, have been deployed to the cloud, that have been used with Vagrant installs, um, and they, they're all free, right? It's all open source, so you can grab them, you can hack them and mess around with them. Um, and there's obviously other loads of guys, uh, you know, with GitHub, uh, GitHub accounts, developers that have written recipes. I mean, there's a recipe to install a version of PHP, but if you wanted to com compile PHP from source and compile it in a certain, way, a certain way, you can do that, right? So I've got a basic chef solo configuration here. So, um, so there's my run list. I mean, this is a JSON file. So as developers, we pretty much know JSON. So you've got some recipes. I'll just you know, basically explain a couple. So that recipe there is installing Apache 2. Um, so basically, what would happen here, because I'm, I'm getting, using the IUS repositories uh, to get PHP, and um, I'm using yum EPL release. So if I just use recipe Apache 2, it's probably just going to get um, the la like a lot of the time, we'll just get the latest version, but you can override that uh, using override attributes. Um, so I'm also overriding, so overriding attributes, so you download a recipe off the internet, but you want to override a, a particular uh, you know, recipe. So over here, I've got, you know, for MySQL, um, I'm overriding the root password. The package name to install, so this particular uh, recipe that installs PHP, that's the package name, it's 5.4, and because I'm using the IUS repositories, it's just gonna get the latest version. So that's not always ideal, but it's okay for development. What you would probably wanna do is be more specific on your version. Um, just another uh, a thing to keep in mind if you start using something like Chef or Puffet and a provisioning tool. If you're installing uh, stuff and it's, you know, you're gonna pull packages out from an external resource, if that resource is down, you know, you're not gonna be able to provision your machine. So Sometimes a mirror can be useful. Um, it's not always necessary, but it's just something to keep in mind because it's you know one of those things that can cause you a bit of pain. Um, so that's a, a basic you know chef a solo configuration. Like I, I did mention, I could you know do probably a whole talk on it. But the idea you know a quick recap is we have the Vagrant file. The Vagrant file has you know configuration options. It uses a provider, which is a you know like a virtualization mechanism, which is uh, VirtualBox and then um, a provisioner. So the provisioner in this case is Chef. So, you know, like we use um, Composer for our projects, we're using Chef to kind of, you know, manage our dependencies of our actual infrastructure. Okay, 
So I'm a developer, so my diagram skills you know, aren't that great, so I do apologize. This is a really basic diagram. You know, like in staging, you might have like load balances and you know, maybe, or production, you might have like 10 machines, so I've just got a box there. But this is a visualization of a vagrant workflow that I kind of made up, but I made this up from kind of my work sort of environment and the, and the way um, I kind of would have worked in the past and the way we currently, you know, presently working. But let's say, you know, we've got, you know, three developers in a team. So the idea, yeah, is that, you know, each development environment is genuinely unique. And so when, you know, the, with the modern development environment, when it's complex, you know, e each one's basically unique. So the Windows developer, or let's say the Mac developer, wants to start using RabbitMQ, he gets it configured on his machine, he gets some messages going to it, oh, this is really cool. He's now got to give that to the Linux developer. The way RabbitMQ, uh, I mean, I'm not even sure if you can install RabbitMQ on, on Mac OS. I mean, I kind of made that up, but. I, you know, I think you kind of get the general idea is that the Linux developer then has to install RabbitMQ. How it works on Linux is maybe a bit different, how you compile it, and so on. And so, you know, that's quite tricky. Um, but generally, the, the uh, developers are checking code into like a version control system. So you've generally got that in your environment, or at least I hope you're using version control. Um, and then you've got a, a deployment tool, and you push that code out to, you know, staging and production. That's a really basic idea. So how would you bring Vagrant into this environment, right? Um, and that's not working. Okay, so you'd install VirtualBox on each developer's machine, so a version of VirtualBox. You'd install Vagrant on each developer's machine. And the idea uh, is that your development is environment is versioned. So you have a Vagrant file which is stored in your version control system, so that has your configuration options, what uh, you know, box file you're using, how you're provisioning that virtual machine. So that's all in the Vagrant file. And then in my particular case, we've got Chef, Chef Solo scripts. So, you know, a lot of the time that Chef Solo scripts can be replaced with a lot of things. But the idea is, is that the Linux developer, what he would do is he would go into ops code or GitHub, he'd get a recipe that installs, uh, you know, RabbitMQ, for example, he'd add it to the run list, right? And then the, he would check that in um, to the Chef Solo scripts. Um, and then uh, the other developer, uh, he says, hey, look here, guys, I've made a change to the development environment. The other developer runs Vagrant Provision, and that tool then gets installed in his development environment. So getting changes and the idea of uniqueness is taken away. So we can get changes from one development environment you know, to another. So it's, it's really, really useful. But there's a lot of other things, a lot of other benefits. You, know? um, you get a new developer that joins your, t your team. Right, and you've got a, a really you know cool application. It's well documented, and you know he's a good PHP developer. All he really wants to do is write code. He doesn't want to spend a day or two setting up his development environment. So you give him the development environment. He runs Vagrant up. He's part of the team, and he can start writing code straight away. Um, you know, there's also other benefits. You know, so let's say like a new version of PHP comes out, and uh, there's a really um, important security flaw or something, you know, your um, DevOps guy or your sysadmin's really on top of it, and he installs it in staging, you know. How you get that back to the developer's environments so they can have the same version, or, you know, it's an, or a developer wants to go from PHP 5.3 to 5.4 because they want a new feature. So you upgrade staging, you know, then you also have to go and upgrade every other developer's machine. But the idea, what you do there is you change the Chef Shiloh script, say, well, we want to start using PHP 5.4, um, so you might have provisioned your box with 5.3, so the, the cool thing is what you could do is you could destroy the old development environment, you could then run Vagrant up, you know, have a new development environment, but you're now on 5.4. Um, okay, so, so that's it. So, I mean, I've basically spoken about the examples I've given are, you know, a development environment where we have you know, one virtual machine running locally. And that's pretty useful, and that'll serve a lot of use cases for a lot of people. But when you want to start doing really cool stuff, you can have multiple VM environments. Um, so I've just got a snapshot of what a multiple uh, a VM environment vagrant configuration file would look like. I can't fit it all into one slide, but the idea here is that we have more than one virtual machine running locally, right? So uh, multiple uh, VM environments. So it's really cool with the ideas of uh, accurately modding a separate web and database server uh, within the same development environment. Um, you know, so you don't want to install everything locally, or you can bring up two virtual machines. One is the actual, you know, web server. One is, you know, uh, the, the development uh, server. I mean, sorry, the, the, the database server. Or, you know, you want to, um, you know, test some varnish uh, VCL. You know, so you can have varnish there, and you can have uh, Apache. Uh, you know, you can test it all locally. That's really cool. Um, uh, 
it's really, really useful. So modeling a cluster of machines is really cool uh, locally. So you can do that with a multi-VM vagrant environment if you really want to. We know uh, testing a load balancer and the effects of unplugging the machine, you can test that all locally, you know. So multi-VM environments uh, with vagrants are really, really cool. If I'm completely honest, I haven't used them a lot. Um, I have played around recently locally with some of this stuff. Um, but I'll talk about a bit more about where that's going uh, in my next couple of slides. Okay, so, so that's Vagrant in a nutshell. Um, let's talk a bit about the future, though. So I think it's fair to say we had this paradigm. We kind of installed everything locally. Um, and this kind of worked you know, for a while. You know, the ecosystem changed. And then we kind of moved you know, things forward. Um, so we install everything in a virtual machine and provision it with a, with a provisioner. You know? I like to think of it, of it as you know, we bring in ideas. You know, we've got all these ideas of the cloud and you know, running everything in the cloud. But it's bringing these cool ideas back down to our development environments. Um, and I think the challenge as developers, we should try and keep up. You know? I think for a long time, our development environment sucked, and we did nothing about it. Um, you know, for me, it's a tool I sort of can't work without now. Um, you know, and I'll never go you know, back to you know, installing stuff locally. And I was chatting to a developer yesterday, and, and he said to me, like, you know, he really enjoys the fact that he doesn't have to install stuff locally on his Mac. It's just all in a, in a virtual machine. So first of all, I think we owe a lot of thanks to this guy. I don't know if uh, any of you know who he is. It's a, a Mitchell Hazamoto. He's the guy that uh, started Vagrant. Um, and so it was kind of like, you know, related to what Errol spoke about yesterday, if you're in the keynote, you know, he was like, in the speech, he really talks about it, but like, you know, installing stuff locally sucks, you know, like he had to, he worked at like a, a, a company where he was working on, you know, different Ruby projects and he had to change from project to project every time. And he found that like, you know, he would like, you know, build a website for someone and then it would come back like, you know, two months later and say, um, you know, uh, we need some changes. And he found that, you know, like really difficult to like, you know, if, if that application was specific to then, you know, configure his development environment again. Um, but there's some, been some really recent uh, developments that are really, I find really interesting. Um, he's recently started a company called HashiCorp. So first of all, he's keeping Vagrant completely open source. Um, but he's basically quit his job full time and he's gone into, into, into Vagrant full time. Um, and that's really cool because already in the couple of months that he's been doing it full time, I've, we've, some, we've seen some really cool developments which I'm going to talk about now. Um, he's a really good guy. Um, I've had one or two emails to him, uh, asked him a couple of questions, um, kind of about where Vagrant was going so I could you know, do this talk, and he, he kind of got back to me, but he obviously couldn't tell me everything. But one thing he did say was that you know, his vision for Vagrant was to have it at a version 2 in 18 months' time. Um, but there are going to be a lot of cool version uh, features and stuff in versions 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3. But let's talk about the new Vagrant providers, right? So the thing with Vagrant is that it was always tied to VirtualBox. Right, so you, your virtualization was VirtualBox, and that was that. So Mitchell went into it full time. He said, "Okay, well, you know, let's you know decouple these two things. You know, let's take the I I idea of the provider one step forward." Right. So you can use VMware with uh, Vagrant when uh, 1.1 is out. I actually don't know what the exact release day of it, uh, of a Vagrant 1.1 is, um, but the really cool thing is it's open source, right? So you can use if you want to use VMware. Um, you can use VMware. If you want to use Amazon EC2, uh, you can. VMware is going to be a paid plugin, but from what he said to me in the email, he said that, that it'll be affordable for developers and companies. So, um, to be completely honest, you know, the idea of Vagrant is really cool. I think one, one of the things that does suck about it is VirtualBox. I mean, I've had some weird things where my you know, file system just you know, becomes corrupted, and then I have to destroy my virtual machine and then just recreate it. Um, that's definitely gotten better. Um, it's definitely improving all the time with VirtualBox and you know, is definitely a lot more stable. But you do have the option to um, you know, use these other providers. So when you run Vagrant up, right, without any changes to your Vagrant conf configuration file, you can run Vagrant up provider equals AWS right, and bring up your development environment in the cloud. And that's quite cool, especially when you start doing multiple VM stuff. right. So you can use a Vagrant file locally and then bring up you know, servers you know, in the cloud, and you can actually test your provisioning scripts on the actual servers that they're going to run. But it just brings up you know, so many use cases. I'm sure people are going to come up with really you know, cool ideas. But essentially, you can start managing your development environment, QA, staging, production, all from Vagrant, uh, which is a command line tool, which is really cool. Um, 
Okay, so collaboration is everything, right? We all open source, we all like open source. Um, you know, PHP is open source. And um, I saw a vagrant file in the joined in project. Um, so the idea that I think we're going to see more and more going forward, and I think you're probably starting to see it. Like I was in the advanced JavaScript talk yesterday, and right at the end the guy said, well, you know, he's created a, a development environment for the samples for his code, and that's really, really cool. So um, the idea is, um, is quite cool. So as part of the source code in your project, you have a vagrant file. So if you want a developer to contribute to your project, you provide him with a vagrant file, he runs vagrant up, he gets the development environment, and he can start hacking on code away, you know, straight away. I saw something too with, I think it's the Zen Framework 1, has a really cool thing that uses vagrant, where you can kind of, um, you can boot a, a vagrant virtual machine, and then there's some like bash scripts in the machine, and you can change the version of PHP, to, you know, and I think that's for them to like, you know, sort of test different, you know, versions and stuff. But it really really takes the, you know, I mean, it takes the idea of collaboration forward a lot. Like, you know, we all know how GitHub's changed everything, you know. Um, and so, vagrant for collaboration, as it evolves, I think, you know, I think, personally, I think the de facto standard, you just have a vagrant file in the project, and so the developer just has to bring vagrant up and write PHP code. That's what we want to do, right? We want to write code and solve problems. We don't want to sit for two days configuring our development environment. Um, so, vagrant 1.1. Um, the plugin system is completely rewritten. Um, so I showed you uh, VMware and Amazon EC2. If you don't want to use uh, one of those providers, you don't have to, you can write your own. So if you wanted to plug Vagrant into OpenStack, into uh, TerraMark or TerraPack, I think it's called, or whatever virtualization solution you have, you can. Um, obviously that's going to evolve more and more and more, but the first concept and idea of this is in Vagrant 1.1, and I'm pretty excited about that. Um, it is Ruby though, so um, you know, maybe we can write a PHP wrapper or something, I don't know. But you know, the idea is you know, we all like challenges. So if you wanted to learn some Ruby code and write your own plugin, um, you know, you can. Then on the, the provisioners like Chef, so I said you can use Puffet and, and you know, Bash scripts. If, if you really wanted to, you can write your own provisioner. Right? So you want to build something in-house, um, that's really cool. And I think the idea, you know, uh, Mitchell said in one of his talks that he said he wants to start seeing a marketplace. So I think there's an opportunity here for the developers. You know, like the marketplace for the App Store came about, you know, maybe you write a really cool plugin, right, that other, other developers want to use. You could maybe sell that, right, and make some money out of it. Or, you know, you, you maybe want to, you know, you know, other developers that are lazy, you know, you can, you know, maybe a marketplace for box files and so on. But there really is an opportunity there. Um, so what's coming up, I think, you know, he, he couldn't give me details, but he's got, I'm, I'm looking forward to them with Vagrant 1.2 and 1.3 because he's working on it full time and because people are contributing it and he can manage those um, contributions to Vagrant a lot better. It's really going to evolve quickly. Um, yeah, so just in summary, I think, you know, <clears throat> we had, you know, this paradigm of install local, that kind of sucked because our development environments have become more complex. You know, we've now virtualized them, um, so we install everything in a virtual machine and provision it. Um, and then, you know, sort of the future, sort of where Vagrant moving, I think it's, it's going to be the future of our development environments for a lot of us. Um, and it's definitely something to watch out for. So just a demo. This is the demo I put together for PHP London. I haven't run it recently. Um, if it does break or something, just tweet me and I'll, I'll fix it. Um, I've been a bit lazy, but the idea is, is if you, get, you download a version of VirtualBox and you download um, a, a Vagrant package. Um, I think Vagrant 1.0.6 is out. I haven't tested it with 1.6. Um, but you just add, add that uh, sort of uh, to your, your host file. Um, you get the project, you run Vagrant up no, no provision, so that'll just boot the virtual machine. Then you can run Vagrant provision to see how the provisioning works. And then if you browse to Vagrant demo in your um, browser, you'll have uh, you know, a project on your machine. And so if you go into the virtual host, you can sort of start editing the code. Um, so, so yeah, so that's a quick demo I put, uh, put together. Um, if you can, this is my first talk. Um, hopefully I covered what I wanted to cover. Um, I am going to be around, um, you know, most of the day and this evening. Um, or if you want to email me, I can you just tweet me or d uh, direct message me on Twitter. I can send you my email address if you've got some questions. Um, but yeah, I really would appreciate some feedback, you know, even if it's negative, um, you know, so I can try and improve this talk, uh, improve, you know, the way I talk. Um, so yeah, I really would appreciate some feedback. And also for the other developers, you know, it takes time to put together, you know, talks and stuff. And, uh, you know, everyone's giving up their free time to give a talk. So, you know, speakers really appreciate um, some feedback. 
Okay, so we've got, I think, about five minutes for questions. If, um, yeah. Sorry, what's that? Um, oh, the slides. The slides will be, there'll be a link on the, uh, so, so he said, uh, where can you get the slides? The slides will be um, on the joined in talk. Um, so, yeah, I'll put them up there shortly after this. I've got a question over here. Where about you put your source code? Do you keep that locally or do you have that installed on your, on your virtual machines? Um, and what happens to your source code when you bring the virtual machines down? Yeah, okay, so the, the, the source codes are locally on your machine, right? Okay, um, and so uh, you basically, using that configuration option I showed, I'll probably go over quite quickly, you share that folder on your, on your host machine with the virtual machine, right? So you're still editing code locally, so that's still that paradigm of editing code locally. When you bring the virtual machine down, the code's still on your machine. Um, I mean, if you wanted to, you could, you know, when the machine boots, pull your source code down and then it disappears. You know, if you want to do something like that, you can. But generally, you keep the code locally. Oh, okay. Um, I've got a question about 1.1 and yeah. VMware. Yeah. Uh, so it's coming, as I understand it. Yeah, it's, it's like the, it's an imminent release. Uh, 1.1, I, I'm not. I mean, you, I can go Google it after. It's coming out soon. So. No, that, that's not a problem. My question is more about: um, Do you know about any problems or differences between the implementation for VirtualBox and for VMware, or is it going to be as seamless, if not a better experience, than with VirtualBox? Um, I think it's going to be better. So the one thing Mitchell has said is that a lot of people are requesting support, obviously, you know, bigger companies and so on. I mean, I'll be completely honest. The idea uh, validation with Vagrant is really good, right? The idea is really good, but VirtualBox has sucked. I mean, I have had some issues with it. I'll be honest, I haven't re re uh, rebuilt my machine for a long time because I think newer versions have got a lot more stable. But I think, you know, that's kind of, you know, what you're trying to... And I mean, there's something to be aware of, but I mean, you know, no technology is perfect. And um, I'm hoping because it's a paid plugin, you know, that obviously there'll be more focus on it, um, you know. But, you know, people, you know... If something does go wrong, you know, we are developers, we all like a challenge. So, you know, contribute back to the project, um, you know, if, you know, but, uh, you know, it, yeah, it's a, a bit of a tough one. I mean, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I do, I do actually agree because I use VirtualBox, now I'm using VMware and I find it so much better. So are you using VMware already with? Yeah, uh, no, no, I'm just using VMware. Okay. Uh, but, um, but did you say that the plugin is going to be commercial, you have to pay for it? Yes, that's correct. You have to pay for it, but he did say he's going to make it affordable, right? So I think that's pretty... I mean, he said he's going to make it affordable. I mean, I don't think he's just going to drop support for VirtualBox. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, you know, the, the, the initial support with uh, VMware is VMware Fusion, but VMware is also going to add support at some point for... Um, I think it's vSphere and there's another sort of version of VMware. I mean, a lot of companies are using VMware, you know, um, so they might have licenses already and so on. Um, look, he said he's going to make it affordable, you know. I don't know what affordable is. He couldn't give me exact pricing, but, you know, 20 pounds or something, you know, if it's going to make your life easier, I'd probably be willing to pay that. That's fine. Okay, thanks a lot. Cheers. Yeah. Do you have any questions from next door? Yeah, sure. I'll just, they'll just uh, shout it and you should hear it. Yeah, okay. It's kind of weird. Yeah. Hello? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just wondering if there was anything built in that would allow for customization on a user by user basis for um, SSH keys or config files that people want to customize for their their servers when they're when they're accessing them yeah okay so something built in for, for like you so customization sort of per per developer um, not that I know sort of you know out the box but I mean if you if you wanted to do something like that um, you certainly could. Um, maybe it's, it's sort of a, a better question to sort of answer afterwards, but I mean, if you wanted to customize, a, you know, per developer, so in terms of SSH keys and stuff, uh, you definitely could. How you would do that, um, yeah, I mean, I can probably think of an example, but I'm sure you could do something like that for sure. So I, I could see with why, why you'd want to do that, you know, like, you know, each developer has a different key to maybe, so they've only got, you know, they may be locked down to different environments. So it's actually a, probably a pretty useful um, use case and concept. But maybe catch me afterwards and we can talk about that a bit more. So another question. Um, I forgot what I was going to ask now. 
Um, now, you mentioned um, using VirtualBox and Samba and having performance issues. Uh, yeah, so... So, yeah. what, what I was going to ask is, because I'm running VirtualBox and Samba, um, and it runs like a dog, um, a sick dog, and um, I, I'm wondering whether um, switching to NFS would improve that, or whether that's just VirtualBox. Uh, yeah, it's quite interesting, because I chatted to some guys at the PHP London meetup, and they also said that they were using Linux, and you know it was really really slow. I haven't had problems, you know, so much. I had problems, and then I switched on N NFS, and it solved it. I mean, are you using Windows locally on your machine, or? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a Windows host. Okay, and a, so um, Linux guest. And you've got a Samba share. I mean, you might find it, it could be maybe Samba configuration. I don't know if you've played around that a bit. It might be like specific versions of something that are giving you an issue. And I think that's what it does come down to because we've got a Windows developer. He's got a Samba share. And um, he generally complains when the unit tests slow down. So um, when they do slow down, uh, it's generally the unit test and not you know the actual file share. So I mean, look here. I'm not going to stand here and say, you know, Vagrant's perfect. There are some issues with it. But I think the idea is right, you know, and it's how we move that idea forward, you know. I mean, it might be worth, you know, troubleshooting and maybe playing it. Look at, like, some of the configurations of it, because maybe you come up with a really cool solution. You can blog about it or, you know, send it to Mitchell and, you know, make people aware of it, you know. But um, put it to you that, you know, it's one of those things. Cool. Thanks. Okay. So I think that's, that's time. So um, thanks very much, guys. Thanks for your time. Thanks very much.